right, the next part of our magical mystery tour of mural weapons. Uh, now we're going to, to discuss Nazi genetic engineering for biological warfare. If you're not having an optimistic day, this will probably not help you very much, but uh, let's get into it anyway. Uh, just to uh, briefly note before we get into this, um, as we know, um, Himmler planned on continuing the war and building up a Fourth Reich. But within, within this, there is also this notion that um, as it, Himmler's assistant, his intelligence chief, uh, was named Schellenberg. When Schellenberg was captured by the British and uh, interrogated, he stated, you know, as the Germans were retreating, they were destroying everything behind them. The Nazis, uh, and this is a general belief amongst the Nazis, that if Germany must lose, then the entire German nation must die. And this is like their, their conception. It's, very, it's, a, it's an actually a very scary conception that they would rather destroy their own nation than lose. Uh, as we'll get into this genetic engineering, I, I think we can see where they might be going with such a conception, but uh, genetic engineering really begins uh, with eugenics. Eugenics is actually an American invention and later went to Germany. Eugenics were the basis of um, the reason why blacks and whites were not allowed to uh, marry for racial hygiene purposes, they wanted to keep the races separate. Uh, genetic engineering grew out of eugenics. Eugenics started studying genetic relationships between different uh, generations of people and trying to identify various social maladies and diseases, etc. It's just important to understand where we get the where genetic engineering actually came from and and where it would go within the uh, Nazi scientific community. Uh, genetic engineering research was conducted by the Wehrmacht and SS. Genetic engineering is a science of using engineering and biology usually associated with augmenting or changing DNA. Sometimes through a vector such as a bacteriophage or a virus. Changing DNA in this way to change coding of functions or altering of functions um, is how this works. Um, this is from, this is uh, some work uh, from Krishnan's Neural Weapons book that I was just quoting. But during the war, the Nazis were interested in bacteriophage research. A bacteriophage or phage is a virus that only disinfects bacteria. Bacteriophages are used among other vectors for cloning and transfer of genes. A German researcher on the genetic and biological research of this time regarding this, this Nazi research on um, uh, molecular engineering, genetic engineering, his name was Trunk, he writes, regarding the issue of research, the project was by all means state of the art. The Wehrmacht research was conducted under the auspices of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, a scientific research institute with many branches. It was also conducted under the order of the Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler. And this is Trunk on uh, one, page 122. Uh, as noted above, uh, genetic engineering uh, was noted in 1933 not Nazi science conference. Um, we only know about this through a title because the actual conference papers, this was, some of the papers were, uh, the researchers claim looked like they were removed on purpose to obfuscate their existence. Uh, we know in 1933 conferences, uh, these papers, that genetic engineering was going to be used. It was one of their primary um, weapons in the, uh, in the coming war. So, um, some more about bacteriophages. And this is an interesting uh, little episode in how the bacteriophages were developed. Um, bacteriophages were developed in France by the Volmans. This was a couple of uh, uh, biological researchers based in Paris. Uh, but they got raided by the Nazis. And after they were raided, they were immediately executed. They were actually taken to Auschwitz and they were executed there. 
the Nazis were very, very interested in gathering up all this bacteriophage research. But just to read a little, in 1943, Nazis raid bacteriophage researchers in France, imprisoning Eugene Bollman and his wife, Elizabeth Bollman. During the 1920s, Eugene Bollman at the Pasteur Institute in Paris attempted to reconcile some technical views of De Hero and Bordeaux on bacteria, uh, bacteriophagy. Uh, Bowman posited the phenomenon was a trait that bacteria acquired through infection or through inheritance. Bowman claimed that lysergenic bacteria involved a form of what he called parahereditary, whereby traits could transmit both vertically through the genetic material passed from parent to offspring and horizontally through genetic material transmitted by infection within the same generation. So what they're saying here is, um, as soon as you entered the bacteriophage, it would start altering your cells within your body and not uh, just wait until you reproduced and your children would, would exhibit those uh, altered traits. Um, continuing on, uh, the Bowman's published several papers on this work between 1925 and 1940. The work on lysogen included the experimental replication of bacteriophage and the production of bacteriophages in non-contaminated bacterial cultures. They also showed that contrary to Durrell's theory, there were many distinct species of bacteriophages. The Bowman's work ended in 1943 when the Nazis took them to the Nazi extermination camp in Auschwitz and executed them. Note this work predates that of Caltech University under Max Dolbrook, and we're gonna encounter Max Dolbrook later. Uh, Max Dolbrook is largely uh, credited with the, the discovery of these things, but that is not true at all. Max Dahlberg was actually working with, um, w when we study the physics of, neuro uh, the quantum physics of neural weapons, Max Dahlberg was working with uh, Pasquale Jordan and a research group at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, which we're going to discuss later. Even though he was in the United States, he was originally from Germany. Uh, Max Dahlberg, uh, he also um, created in 1940 the post-World War II genetic engineering uh, that was centered at Cold Spring Harbor in Long Island, New York, which is, um, according to some conspiracy theories, also where a lot of neural weapons, uh, ex-Nazis who were brought to America did their neural weapons research in uh, Cold Springs Harbor, which is close to Montauk, uh, Long Island. Uh, if you like the Montauk Chronicles, you, you would be interested in that little fact. Um, like I said, the, the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute uh, in Germany is a scientific um, research institute uh, run by the government and with private uh, contributions. Uh, it was designed to uh, facilitate scientific understandings and uh, develop technology there. And uh, one of the people, like we all know who Joseph Mengele is, like uh, Mengele is vilified in all these different things and they like, I was recently watching a show on the hunt for Hitler in Argentina, and they claimed that Mengele was like the inner circle of Nazism, and Mengele was never even close to the inner circle of Mengele. Mengele was an assistant to von Verscher. Von Verscher was a Dutch noble who became head of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institutes for Anthropology in 1942. Uh, Joseph Mengele, before the war was actually his assistant, von Verscher directed Joseph Mengele and all his research at Auschwitz. Von Verscher also directed the research of who we will read about later here, Karen Magnuson, who also did research for von Verscher. But the interesting thing about von Verscher, even though he was, like Joseph Mengele gets arrested and, and escapes mysteriously, um, even though the war crimes tribunals were after Joseph Mengele, his boss was never touched. They didn't even bring it up. And he finished out his career after the war at the University of Munster, which is uh, in western, uh, northwest Germany, in the British sector close to Holland, where his uh, family's, he is a baron, he's, uh, he is Dutch royalty. Um, so, to continue. Genetics in Nazi Germany is carried out in terms of scientific research at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, KWI of Anthropology, Human Heredity, and Eugenics. 
It was founded in 1927, and it was partially funded by the Rockefeller Foundation again. Uh, like I said, in 1942, uh, Bob Verscher took it over, and then he was uh, telling uh, Mengele what to do. Uh, Joseph Mengele joined Verscher in January of 1937. He previously received a PhD in anthropology from the University of Munich in 1935. He became an assistant, one of four, to, Ver to Von Verscher at his institute in Frankfurt. At that time, this is before he joined the KWI, he had his own institute in Frankfurt, which worked on categorizing people by race. Or they would issue racial certificates. You had to be racially pure to be a part of the Nazi um, regime and to, you know, have any kind of function within that regime, you had to be certified as being racially pure. And if any, what they would do is they were investigating the, the racial purity of different people and issuing certificates that these people were either Aryan or Jew um, for court cases and other civil matters. Uh, Mengele received a second PhD for medicine with a dissertation, uh, Kinship Examination in Cases of Cleft Lip, Jaw, and Palate. In 1939. Uh, during the war, he was a captain, uh, not a high rank, uh, a captain in the Nazi SS. In 1943, Verscher encouraged Mengele to be transferred to Auschwitz, where Verscher used Mengele to acquire specimens for the research from concentration camp victims. He also was responsible for administering Zyklon B in the gas chamber. In one story of his machine-like efficiency, he at one point cleared out an entire barracks of women during a typhus epidemic, exterminating them all to make room to move other inmates into the desanitized barracks, thus performing a swap of one barracks to the next to create space to sanitize the next barracks. In another example of his machine-like reductive thinking, he tried to artificially join, artificially join two twins together by sewing them together and they eventually died of gangrene within the operation, just to give you the monstrous nature of Mengele's um, mind. Um, there are some others of research that he did for von Mercer. Um, one of these was the twin research. Uh, the twin research was in part intended to prove the supremacy of heredity over environment and thus strengthen the Nazi premise of the superiority of the Aryan race. Uh, Neasley and others reported that the twin studies may have also been motivated by an intention to increase the reproduction rate of the Germans, of the German race, by improving the chances of racially desirable people having twins. Uh, this later comes into effect. Uh, Mengele later escapes and goes to South America. Uh, in, in Candida Gadol in Brazil, um, there are a lot of um, largely German twins where Mengele, you know, did some more research there, so we can see the continuation of his research even after the war. Uh, was von Verscher involved in his research after the war? Uh, I don't know, I haven't run any in, into any direct proof of that, but he's obviously continuing the research from, from the war, after the war in South America. Uh, at Auschwitz, he was involved in the following studies that directly informed Verscher's research goals in, in, at the KWI. Um, Project Augenfarb, which is a nice study uh, of the eye color, which involved Karen Magnuson, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, the Zwilling Forschung, uh, twin studies, and uh, Project Irish Scoper on tuberculosis. Uh, these are protein studies in tuberculosis. What they did with these uh, tuberculosis and protein studies was create profiles of different um, uh, racial types, even extending down into clans. Uh, they would they were able to identify people by their clans rather than not just their race. The race would be a larger typology than say a clan would be a sub typology. Uh, Mengele, it is noble that he escaped detainment after the war under questionable circumstances, raising the specter of collaboration with Allied security forces. He eventually resettled in South America, at one point being reunited with his family and visiting West Germany while being hunted by anti-Holocaust activists, West German intelligence, and the Israeli Mossad. While in South America, he continued his twin studies in Candido Gadol, Brazil, creating a number of twins of Germanic ancestry. Um, 
Now, Karen Magnuson, uh, she was involved in these eye studies. Um, another Richard assistant was Karen Magnuson. She received her doctorate in 1932 from the University of Göttingen. She studied at the Zoological Institute of the University after receiving her PhD. She then became a teacher, a profession she returned to after the war, even though remaining an avowed Nazi. In 1935, she was connected to the Nazi Racial Policy Office for Hanover. In 1936, she wrote Race and Population Policy Tools. In 1941, she stopped teaching after receiving a scholarship to the KWI. There she worked in the Department of Experimental Pathology of Heritage under uh, Hans Nachstein. She studied inheritance of eye color in rabbits and humans, drawing the conclusion that eye color is genetically selected and also by hormones. At Auschwitz, at one point injecting adrenaline into the eye samples, this was at Auschwitz, um, she would inject from the eye samples they got, I'm sorry, this is in her lab, KW. From the eye samples they got from Auschwitz, she would inject the hormone adrenaline in to see if they could change the eye color, which, um, again, we're here um, working with the eyes. I don't, there's some, um, it's an interesting topic. Uh, what does eye color have to do with absorption of electromagnetic waves? Do lighter eyes, say blue eyes, do blue eyes, um, conduct more electromagnetic uh, energy than, say, dark eyes. So I'm kind of interested in what exactly they're, they're doing here. But she met Mengele in 1943 at the KWI. One area she studied specifically was heterochromia iridium, in which the eye color is different between each eye of the person. So. One further uh, note about um, Magnuson, it's not hard to extrapolate why racial supremacists fixated on eye color for genetic research. Although there may be more to the eye studies than just simple genetic research, the use of hormones and the attempt to try to change the eye color is an interesting aspect of this research. As noted, the study of hormones not only is limited to this study, but was also involved in other studies by the Nazi scientists. Uh, we're gonna read about this also. Hormones and neural weapons, um, hormones are, are manipulated by neural weapons. Hormones are one of the things that they target the most to uh, get your brain to do different things. Also, uh, according to the targeted uh, individuals community, 70% of people in the targeted individuals community are women, and women have uh, many more hormones than men. A primary reason women have these hormones is for child rearing and childbirth. Uh, so there is definitely a direct correlation between hormones and neural weapons. In 1939, von Verscher was approached by the German biochemist Adolf Friedrich Johann Boudinant, who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1939 for his work on sex hormones. And this starts to get it back into reproduction and twin steps. Adolf Windaus and Walter Scholl advised him to work on hormones extracted from ovaries. This led to the discovery of estrone and other primary female sex hormones. This work was conducted in 1934 in Gdansk at the Chemisch Institute, extract, extracting progesterone and testosterone in 1935. Uh, Verscher, as head of the KWI genetics program, was approached by Emil Abderholden to do blood studies of which Verscher would direct Joseph Mengele in lab work for this process, among other assistants to Verscher. Abderholden did extensive work in the analysis of proteins, polypeptides, and enzymes. His Abwehr ferment defensive enzymes theory stated that an immunological challenge will induce production of proteases. This work was to be used to racially classify people based on their serology, their blood work. Um, I believe it was had to do with their proteases. Uh, in, an, in October of 1943, Verscher, Abderholt, and Budenov worked on joint projects funded by the Wehrmacht. Verscher, working with Abderholt, begins studies on human blood. Mengele takes over 200 blood samples from Auschwitz prisoners. This work is done in conjunction with Budenov. Several research assistants are used, such as Joseph Mengele, Gunther Hillman, Ingard Haas. Trunk had postulated that the real work 
here, rather than studying proteins in enzyme reactions, was actually, uh, this is Trunk speaking, according to Isabel Heinemann's estimates, the RSHA planned to perform race biological examinations on about 2 million people. Thus seen in the context of its time, the project represented scientific work profoundly relevant for Nazi racial policy with potentially extensive destructive consequences for the people affected by this policy. This research of using biology to identify people by not just family, but also clan, as well as give a geographical spread to genetic research. Another researcher uh, named Muller Hill, also a journalist, notes in an interview with Imgard Haas. Imgard Haas had spent at first three months with Abrahald in, in Hall to learn the defense enzyme reaction in order to analyze the blood of gypsy twins, Russians, Uzbeks, and Kyrgyz. In the first step, the involuntary blood donors were racial, anthropologically classified. Such anthropometric race determinations were required in order to subsequently to be able to connect the desired blood analysis results, that is the race specific proteins to a precise type of race. From this blood substrates were obtained as indicated, for instance, from Berkshire's third report to the DFG. <coughs> Berkshire has an ominous tones to his research, in which he admits to seeking more than simple genetic racial classification but how genes influence infection, which is obvious, which is obvious of use to racial classification in Nazism. <coughs> Bershaw at one point remarked, my efforts are no longer aimed at establishing the impact of hereditary influence on some infectious diseases, but how it works and what are the processes happening along the way. In other words, it seems to be targeting infection to different clans, families, and ultimately races. Um, and an even more sinister development within the thought of Joseph Mengele is one illuminating entry from his journals that he maintained after the war in South America. He writes, everything will end in catastrophe. If natural selection is altered to the point that gifted people are overwhelmed by billions of morons, he warns, predicting that 90% of humans will starve due to stupidity and the remaining 10% will survive like reptiles survived. The rest will die, just like the dinosaurs did. We have to prevent the rise of the idiot masses, he writes. The feeble-minded person, village idiot, was suffering from farmers because of his social status and low income, he writes. This separation is no longer the case in the age of technology. He is now on the same level with the farmer's son who went to the city. We know that selection rules all, all we, we know that selection rules all nature by choosing and exterminating. Those who were unfit to accept the rule of more accomplished human beings or they were pushed out or exterminated. Weaker humans were excluded from reproducing. This is the only way for human beings to exist and to maintain themselves. He says inferior morons should be exterminated, adding we have to make sure that nature's suspended eradication will continue through human arrangements. Birth control can be done by sterilizing those with deficient genes. Putting the genetic research and engineering perspective of Mengele's own admission of 90% of the Earth's population will die in a catastrophe with the purpose of using molecular biology to identify people by race and claim, it is a question as to whether this research was a form of a final solution. Leaving the mythical Aryans to rule the world as lone survivors of a biological warfare.